Well, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. I'm uh, greatly honored uh, to be here with you this morning and uh, to talk to you a little bit about uh, skill development and uh, uh, its relationship to the knowledge economy. Uh, I have been given about 45 minutes for my talk and I'll try to keep within that time. And then we can, if there's time, we can have some Q and A's also. Uh, I'd like to start by uh, sharing this screen if it works. I hope it does. Yes, can you see the screen? I hope the screen is visible. Uh, yes, sir, it is, it is visible. Okay, well, trying to change the slides here. Sorry. Uh, let me try once again. Right. Well, we live in an age where knowledge is the key driver for socioeconomic development. And uh, uh, skills come at all levels. Uh, education is absolutely essential, whether formal or informal, in order to create a skilled population. And I'm going to focus on the higher set of skills sector here. Uh, uh, skills can be at different levels. They can be for technical and vocational level of skill development, which is also extremely important. And I hope some of your speakers will cover that. But I will be focusing on the uh, higher level of skills, uh, which uh, uh, relate to uh, the expansion of horizons of knowledge in areas like uh, biotechnology or uh, material sciences or genomics or other related areas. Uh, uh, this is a slide taken from a report which McKinsey Global came out uh, a, a couple of years ago, and they predicted that by 2025, there will be a hundred trillion dollar, not a hundred billion dollar, a hundred trillion dollar impact of uh, uh, various disruptive innovations of which uh, artificial intelligence alone was, is predicted to have an impact of about $15.7 trillion, just AI alone. And other technologies that they mentioned included uh, IOTs, uh, autonomous vehicles, advanced robotics, next generation genomics, uh, 3D printing, materials, renewable energy, etc. So there is a huge change coming and we need to ride this change rather than get, get buried under it. So there is a uh, and this is the challenge for countries uh, like Pakistan. It's both a challenge and an opportunity because we are blessed with a very large young population uh, and uh, which gives us a significant advantage over many other advanced countries which have aging populations. If we can only invest uh, in our youth and release the creative uh, talents that they have within. And so uh, the, the main challenge for countries like Pakistan is to ultimately develop the ability to manufacture and export high technology goods. And I think that in a one liner, I would say that is the key now for development. That is the strategy adopted by countries like Singapore or others, the ability to manufacture and export high quality, high technology goods. And uh, CPEC provides us with a window of opportunity. I was in October last year, I was in China when, it, when an institute was named after me. And uh, uh, the, I was accompanied by our Minister for Science and we met the Chinese Minister of Science. And we have uh, agreed to form a joint committee where we will be focusing only on uh, identifying specific high technology items, and then having joint ventures uh, between Pakistani companies and Chinese companies in the manufacture and export of high technology goods in, uh, as a part of the CPEC program. So this is, uh, and 
this I think would be, and then we need to gear up our human resource training, uh, creating the enabling environment, ease of business, uh, getting the necessary uh, incentives in place to attract Chinese companies here, all that would be geared towards those ends. Uh, just to show what some countries are doing in order to make science, technology and innovation the key driving force, the Korean Minister of Education and Science is the Deputy Prime Minister of Korea. So they've, they've appointed him as the Deputy Prime Minister to give him the political clout to shape the national strategies uh, according to uh, the needs of the country uh, using science and technology. Austria has done the same. The Austrian Minister of Science uh, is also the Deputy Prime Minister of Austria. He's also their Minister for Economic Affairs. When I met the President of Austria a few years ago, he introduced me to him and he uh, said that he also looks after our economic affairs. So this is the way forward to invest in education, in science, in technology and in innovation. Uh, so it's whether, whether it's large countries like China or small countries like Singapore, the story is the same. It's knowledge and research driving economies. And so this is the highest level of skill sets that we need to create in certain specific areas in order to move Pakistan forward. Uh, Singapore has a population of only about 5.5 million exports last year were around 400 billion Singapore dollars, about 330 billion US dollars. Compare that with Pakistan, Pakistan ki exports 25 Arab dollar, Singapore 30 Arab dollar. Reason, vision, uh, one man, Lee Kuan Yew, and then he transformed the country, country in a manner that you see today. Uh, Singapore, uh, is uh, ranked amongst the top countries in the world, uh, number one in terms of ease of doing business uh, and also uh, amongst the top uh, countries uh, in terms of uh, their global competitive in index. And that's uh, really very important. So this is what happened in Singapore. The, uh, this is GDP per capita. Uh, for over a 50 year period, 1960 to 2010. Uh, Singapore overtaking the UK, the blue line is Singapore, red is United Kingdom, the green is the world average, Singapore overtaking the UK and uh, having a much higher per capita income than many of the other advanced countries in the world. This is the story of China in one slide. On the extreme left are the years, Second column going down from starting from 860 st Chinese students being sent abroad. Uh, the number has grown uh, now to about 600,000 students. So China is sending about 600,000 students every year to top universities and research centers for PhD and postdoctoral level training. The third column are the number of students coming back after completion of their studies and research training and about half a million now are coming back every year. So half a million students are returning to China each year and they are joining the Chinese workforce. They are being clustered in centers of excellence and they're driving this huge engine of the Chinese economy forward, especially in medium and high tech areas which have the maximum uh, return on investment. So, the, so whether it's uh, Singapore or China, it is, the story is the same. Never before in the history of mankind have so many been transformed so, so quickly as has happened in China. Uh, I was lucky to get the highest award from uh, China. I met their, pre this was this year on the 10th of January. Uh, when I met their president, Xi Jinping, and uh, this was the institute you mentioned is named after me. If you see on the right, uh, the Minister of Science is standing next to me. Uh, this is in Hunan. It's a large six-story building which has been established. Uh, and this is a picture of the inauguration ceremony of this institute. Uh, so 
if you look at what is going on in the world exports in terms of the share of manufactured products, it's the medium and high technology which is dominating. Uh, the top two lines on the right, the red low technology goods or green, the resource based goods are now have the smallest share. Uh, this goes up to 2004, but uh, if you extend it to 2020, the purple line high tech has now overtaken the medium tech and represents the major share of the world exports uh, in terms of technology. So this is where the money is. Pakistan is still alas trapped in the low technology goods with 60% of our exports being low value added textiles and in the high value added area, we are almost zero. So this is the tragedy because our leaders never really understood the importance of a knowledge economy. Uh, a few slides about what we tried to do, and I'm delighted that Sohail is here, Dr. Sohail Nakvi. Uh, we worked as a team during those years. When uh, uh, it started in 2000, when I was appointed as a Minister for Science, and later uh, as Chairman HEC, and we had the good luck of having President Musharraf there, who we managed to convince uh, the importance of investing in science and higher education. And there was a 6,000% increase in the development budget of science and later a 3,500% increase in the development budget of higher education. And many things were done. I don't have time to go through all of them, but I think the key most important step was focus on having high quality faculty. Universities are not about beautiful buildings, they are about beautiful minds. So, so focusing on the development of high quality faculty, and I'm also very happy that Dr. Mukhtar is here. Uh, he, was, it, he came to Pakistan as a result of one of our initiatives, the Foreign Faculty Hiring Program, and there were about 600 people who came back under that program to Pakistan, about 300 for short-term assignments, and another 300 or so longer-term assignments. So we dramatically changed the salary structures. It made sure that we had research, ample research funding available, created a digital library for access to literature, provided free access to sophisticated instrumentation, <coughs> and ensured that there were jobs on arrival. So a matchmaking used to be made, and a number of other steps. And that uh, resulted ultimately, by the time 2008 came, when I resigned HEC and left, we had several universities ranked amongst the top uh, uh, 500 of the world under the Higher Education Times UK rankings. Uh, unfortunately, they stepped back and I don't believe we have a single one now under the Higher Education Times UK rankings, although we do have a NUST under the QS rankings uh, around 390 or, or 350, something like that. And there were many uh, uh, reports written by uh, Professor Michael Rode, for instance, chairman of the UN Commission on Science and Technology. More recently, an article by Thomson Reuters in 2016, which compared Pakistan with other uh, BRIC countries, Brazil, Russia, India, and China, and uh, compared the rate of increase of highly cited papers uh, with the BRIC countries and said that Pakistan has emerged as a country with the highest percentage of, of increase in high quality papers. And this is an interesting graph, which some of you may or may not have seen. Uh, this was kindly prepared and sent to me by Professor Rahil Kamar from Coms, Rector of Comsats. And uh, this is the number of public international publications in impact factor journals per 10 million individuals. So this is per capita, Pakistan okay, versus India. India. So Pakistan, Pakistan is uh, uh, green and India is, uh, uh, is uh, pur light purple or red. Uh, so if you look at the extreme left, uh, Pakistan were, had 44 publications per 10 million population versus 172 of India. Uh, India is a good country to compare because we have similar background. India, of course, had a head start with a visionary governments under Nehru and emphasis on uh, education and science and technology, whereas Pakistan was uh, uh, way back in, the, in these areas. 
But then after the HEC came in, uh, the thing started changing. And as you move towards the right in the graph, you see uh, Pakistan overtaking India in 2017, and now is about 20 or 25 percent ahead of India. In 2018, we were about 20 percent ahead of India in terms of research publications per 10 million population. Uh, this is no small achievement uh, and uh, indicates, in spite of the ups and downs of the Higher Education Commission with cuts in funding and other uh, difficulties that higher education had paid, had, had faced, uh, the investment that we made in human resources and the equal environment that uh, we created at that time uh, has uh, sustained itself to a great degree uh, till now, although last two years we have again been facing se severe difficulties, and uh, but still it's an interesting comparison. Uh, in terms of R&D expenditure in Pakistan, uh, as a percentage of G GDP, this is taken from the World Bank. Uh, again, this is uh, an unfortunate story. Uh, if you look at the left in 2000, uh, when I came in as the Federal Minister for Science and President Musharraf uh, was persuaded uh, to uh, start investing in science and education, uh, things started changing. By 2008, we had reached about from 0.24% of GDP, we had reached about 0.63% of GDP according to the World Bank uh, criteria. According to our own internal calculations, we had touched 0.8 something. But in any case, this is the World Bank uh, criteria, uh, which, I, which I'm showing. But then unfortunately, it started declining. And it has come down again to about 0.2 uh, or something like that. So this is a, a sad story. But then the, again, this year, uh, there's been a significant increase in funding to science because uh, the present prime minister has formed a task force on knowledge economy about 120 billion rupees worth of projects some have been already approved and others are under approval uh, this is a significant amount of money when you consider that the total development budget of for the ministry of science and technology was not only about uh, three or four three billion last year so another 120 billion rupees worth of injection into science and uh, uh, emerging technologies is a significant amount of money coming in. And uh, a lot of it is being going to be in, spent in universities. Uh, the government has formed a number of task forces. I mentioned the knowledge economy task force. And here uh, our uh, priorities are uh, education, skill development, including technical training, uh, improving the quality of technical training, uh, advanced agriculture, IT related technologies, minerals, and a focus on emerging technologies. For instance, I'm in the process of setting up a university near PM house, uh, in the PM house, the land behind the PM house, focused on new and emerging technologies. And Sohail will be very happy to, happy to hear that the Pakistan Austrian University, uh, the campus is now almost complete and the classes which were supposed to start uh, at the end of this year uh, they will now start next year there's been a slight delay because of uh, covid but that things are largely on track and these are funded by the kp government so the pakistan austrian fachhochschule is very much on so we invested a lot of effort and at least there is one really high class and there are going to be four chinese centers of excellence as you know so also in this uh, in this university so it'll be a tri triangle with Pakistan, China, Austria coming in and interacting together uh, in the Pakistan Austrian University. I'm personally involved in three national task forces. I'm chairing the science and technology task force of the prime minister. I am the vice chairman of the knowledge economy task force, which is chaired by the prime minister himself and has the federal minister of finance, planning, science and technology, education, IT, et cetera, as members. And I'm also co-chairing the IT and telecom task force with the minister. And so that gives me a certain level of leverage to try and push things with the government in trying to invest in, uh, in education and science and in, in innovation. And uh, uh, 
so the Austrian University, as I mentioned, and we are in the process of setting up uh, technology parks across the country in various universities. So that is again something which is on track and a major venture capital fund of 6 billion rupees, uh, which we have uh, a project is uh, uh, now being approved, uh, which LUMS had prepared actually uh, the project in consultation and that is to help uh, the development of uh, VC funding. Uh, and we have a number of uh, measures that we are, uh, we hope will be placed uh, in Pakistan, such as granting of pioneering status to high tech industries with long, long term tax breaks and uh, uh, increasing the capacity of industry to produce uh, and manufacture and export high technology goods. So, this was just a very quick flash overview. All this would not have been possible, it was entirely a teamwork. Uh, where people like Dr. Swail Nakvi and his, the group under him, uh, Dr. Akram Sheikh was the Deputy Chairman Planning Commission after a year within the HEC. And uh, of course, President Mush Musharraf at that time, strongly supportive. That support has uh, waned afterwards. But again, I see that Prime Minister Imran is very keen to move things forward in this direction. And he's asked me to help set up some top class universities as well as improve the existing universities. So I am trying to do whatever little I can. Uh, just uh, to show the kind of the strange and wondrous world of uh, the skill sets that are in, needed at the top. You know, it used to take, it, it takes hundreds of thousands of years for new species to develop and evolve through natural um, competition, through mutations, etc. Now, according to the new technologies that have been developed, you can develop new species within a matter of weeks through a technique called CRISPR-Cas and through other changes in this where you can actually splice genes and uh, take genes from one plant and insert them to others and create new properties, new types of uh, plants as well as animals. Scientists have created orchids uh, which are luminescent by taking genes from the deep sea jellyfishes and from the firefly and putting them into flowers. Uh, golden rice has been developed with uh, pro-vitamin A built into it, uh, so certain genes, so that uh, children that used to die out of uh, lack of vitamin A, their lives, thousands of lives are being saved. Uh, why do you get mangoes only in the summer in Pakistan and not in the winter? Uh, because every plant has a biological clock which tells it uh, went to flower, went to fruit. And so uh, one of the genes involved is the DET1 gene, but there are others also. And scientists have learned how to turn these genes on and off. Uh, and so you will have, so we are coming to a time when you will have uh, fruits and vegetables around the year, uh, irrespective of the seasons. So this is the technique I was talking about, the molecular scissors. Uh, for splicing genes and this is very easy to implement and this is being used in many across the world to improve the uh, ability of uh, the productivity and disease risk resistance of plants. Uh, there have been exciting developments on anti-aging compounds and there are a number of uh, substances now available including resveratrol, nicotinamide, adenine, dinucleotide, metformin, etc. Uh, which not only slow down the process of aging, but actually reverse it. And so it's thought that uh, uh, that children being born today will have ages of 120 ages of 120 plus. Uh, so uh, huge developments in the area of biotechnology. Uh, similarly, uh, there is a whole range of initiatives uh, creating uh, synthetic uh, uh, organisms, uh, 3D printing is being used to print human organs. The field of medicine is changing with the advent of stem cell technologies. And uh, uh, Professor Yamanaka got his Nobel Prize for his work on uh, IPS cell induced pluripotent stem cells. Uh, so you don't need uh, to extract uh, from the fetus or you can actually convert now uh, any cell, uh, skin cell, back to a stem cell-like cell and then re-differentiate it into a blood cell or whatever 
So uh, amazing developments which are taking place. This is a picture of a 3D printed kidney. kidney. So the kind of skills that are required in, in these areas, the skill sets, uh, they uh, come through dedicated work and learning of the frontiers. Uh, cut off the tail of a lizard, it grows back. Cut off the hand of a person, it doesn't grow back. Why not? It has been found there are some micro tiny RNA switches, micro RNAs, uh, which uh, are involved in the growing back of the lizard tail. And scientists are now looking for similar switches so that human organs can also be regenerated in the same manner. Uh, now turn to the biology human biology computer interface. And uh, again, uh, artificial intelligence is coming in in a big way. Uh, Watson, for instance, has been developed by IBM, a law division and a medicine division offering legal advice or medical advice uh, to uh, clients. And these are commercially available. So lawyers in the USA are today, uh, young lawyers are worried where there'll be a future for them because it's possible to get legal advice from Watson at a fraction of the cost, what it'll cost lawyers. Similarly, in the recent competition between uh, Watson Medicine with cancer specialists, it was found that in 99% of the cancer cases, the remedies suggested by the computer were the same as those suggested by the specialists. And in about 30% of the cases, there were other alternatives also suggested by Watson. So there are amazing developments going on. For instance, this gentleman is wearing a device around his head which can read his thoughts, his commands, and he can therefore drive a car uh, in streets just by thought control. Uh, electronic lollipops have been developed. This lady is blind, but she can see with her tongue. As you see, she's wearing glasses, but in her hand is a, uh, is a device, lollipop-like device with 400 sensors. The moment she puts it on her tongue, uh, eyesight, partial eyesight is restored. And uh, these are commercially available devices available for the last six or eight years uh, for restoring eye. So you actually see with your brain, eyes are only a mechanism for image transfer. <clears throat> Another fa fascinating area where I've been involved in for the last 15 to 20 years now is the field of neuroscience. The human brain, 100 billion neurons, each talking to 10,000 other neurons. So 100 billion times 10,000 synaptic connections. Arguably the most complex object of our universe is our own brain. How does it work? Thoughts are not abstract as one might imagine. They're made of atoms and molecules. What atoms, what molecules constitute thoughts? What is the molecular basis of memory? This is something that I've been deeply involved in for the last 15 years. We have a large number of international patents as well as many publications in this field. And uh, the uh, models proposed earlier uh, did not offer any chemical explanation. Uh, so they were talking about functional and structural stability. So we came forward some years ago uh, with the, uh, the proposal that uh, thoughts are made of, memories are made of uh, essentially glycoproteins. Uh, if you look at a glycoprotein, it consists of a protein molecule uh, with sugars attached to it. And sugars have, have, have a large number of hydroxyl groups, which are waving around normally. And uh, however, through hydrogen bonding, they can, their conformations can be frozen. So patterns can be formed. And these patterns can be through intramolecular or intermolecular hydrogen bonding. And I'm not going to take you into the depths of it, but uh, what we then proposed was that, that the process of reasoning could involve, in, so memories are stored in the form of these patterns, whether it's memories of your childhood or your knowledge of what you have learned, these are various patterns. The larger number of hydrogen, the larger the D number of hydrogen bonds, the stronger the patterns and the stronger the memories. And uh, so the process of logic 
is a multi-dimensional overlay of these patterns. Uh, and that is what constitutes lo logic and that is what constitutes emotions. And uh, I have a large number of papers and reviews published. Those who are interested, I'll be happy to share with them. I don't want to give you uh, a lecture here, but the area of new neural plasticity and memory is extremely interesting. Uh, and uh, we have developed some anti-epileptic compounds, which we have patented abroad. Again, uh, I don't want to go into details here, but we are now working on Alzheimer's and Parkinson's and trying to understand the molecular basis of these diseases and how we can restore them. So this was just a little bit about my own work uh, that we are doing at Karachi University. Uh, let me now take you into the area of uh, materials. Again, there are amazing materials which have been developed. Uh, the Harry Potter's disappearing cloak is now a reality. Uh, so uh, these are the meta materials with bent light and they are being used for cloaking submarines and tanks. Similarly, there are intelligent materials. Those of you who remember seeing the, the Terminator film, you fire a bullet, a hole is created, and then in, it disappears in uh, seconds. Well, these materials uh, are already a reality. These are polymeric materials, a polymeric layer in between, which heal themselves. And graphene uh, is again a wonder material, 200 times stronger than steel. Uh, some uh, two professors at Manchester University got a Nobel Prize for their work. Uh, similarly, there are materials which are, for instance, there's bulletproof paper, which is available. And jackets, bulletproof jackets are being made out of nanocellulose, light absorbent bulletproof. And then the whole field of nanotechnology is finding so many applications. And we have set up the first center for nanotechnology, National Center for Nanotechnology as a part of my institute at Karachi University. Uh, where we, by the way, have also the first national center for virology, uh, where uh, uh, work is going on on uh, COVID-19 and other viruses. Uh, uh, similarly, there are uh, devices which have been developed for real-time translation. This lady is speaking to a Chinese person. She doesn't know a word of Chinese, but in her ear is a little device. So she speaks in English. He hears, he has a similar device. He hears in Chinese. He speaks in Chinese, she hears in English. So these are available, these are available through many, many companies now. And these are devices again, which are being used for espionage purposes. Uh, these are uh, small drones, which look like flies, which can be taken to the, your prime minister or your president's office and record all the conversation and transfer it uh, to uh, the US, uh, to Washington and then to US. Electronic textiles are here, which uh, change their shape and uh, which, uh, uh, are, uh, which can change their design. So you press a button and you have thousands of designs stored in them. Uh, EP textiles here, here, very interesting, fascinating chemistry involved, which uh, uh, slowly change their colors. So your wife may go to a party wearing a green dress and come back wearing a maroon dress because the color has changed in those two or three hours that she's been away. 3D printing, I mentioned, is uh, very, houses are being made in days uh, by 3D printing, this one in 24 hours in China, and even jet engines are being produced. So this is the highest level of skill sets uh, for where creat creativity uh, comes to its own. Uh, I would like to now just uh, uh, in the last uh, uh, eight or 10 minutes that I have left, uh, go to uh, a little bit about what we are doing in Pakistan. I'm heading the COVID-19 uh, uh, task force also. And uh, we have been focusing in five different areas. Uh, one is the discovery of drugs that can attack coronavirus. And we have large scale clinical trials now going on. We have formed an organization called Protect, got about 14 different institutions together. And we have uh, clinical trials going on on a number of uh, drugs, repurposing of existing drugs. So these are underway and the results should start coming out next week. And uh, these include hydroxychloroquine, ozeltamivir, azithromycin, and a number of other drugs which are being done. And these are all the various organizations involved across the country in these clinical trials. Uh, 
the next thing that we'll be involved in is the expansion of testing facilities. Pakistan was only doing 400 tests per day. So we have, uh, so within the, the last three months, this capacity has been increased from 400 tests per day now to about 40 to 50,000 tests per day. And there have been facilities set up across the country uh, and expanded, which in, uh, uh, one uh, laboratory is the institute within my own center, uh, which, has, which we had set up, in fact, before the COVID-19 uh, situation came forward. And we have a BSL biosafety level three facility where we are doing testing of about 2,000 samples per day in Lahore, the Punjab Forensic Science Agency. This is the view of the new testing facility that we have established uh, in the Punjab Forensic Science Agency through a grant that we obtained uh, through the British government. Uh, and uh, 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 in the National Virology Institute at Karachi University, these are some pictures taken from there uh, where we are, uh, we are testing uh, for the, uh, for, 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 we have done the structure of the virus, by the way, and found that it had mutations at eight points. And now we have started a hundred genome project where we are looking at the structures of different uh, uh, the, the samples obtained from different parts of the country. Uh, this structure of the virus was done at the Jamilur Rahman Center for Genomics Research. This is named after my father because I had some savings and I invested them into this center at the University of Karachi as a part of my institute. And this also has the uh, uh, the, uh, on the top floor, another floor has now been constructed on top of it, uh, where we have uh, a forensic uh, testing laboratory also, the, all the SIN government's forensic testing is also being done here. So uh, we are also involved in ventilator manufacture in Pakistan. And uh, <clears throat> these have been, uh, so there's been a lot of effort in this area in the last few months. And uh, we have uh, from our, starting from 50 designs, Three have been finally shortlisted, and uh, uh, these are prototypes have already been developed, and large scale manufacture will begin soon. Of these purely indigenously manufactured uh, uh, ventilators, uh, uh, vaccines uh, is one another area. The fifth one, uh, just last week, our institute uh, we have a 120 bed hospital as a part of the International Center for Chemical and Biological Sciences. And the Chinese came to us and one of their top companies uh, has, a, uh, we have signed an agreement with them last week and uh, well, two weeks ago, actually. And uh, uh, an application has been made to draft to start clinical trials in uh, Pakistan. Uh, these trials have already been com completed on phase one and phase two and now are under phase three in China. So we will be starting phase one clinical trials as soon as draft approval comes. And this would also mean that Pakistan would have uh, the vaccines available preferentially. And we are also negotiating with them to actually start manufacture of the vaccine itself in Pakistan once the clinical trials are completed. So this was an overview. My emphasis is here that uh, it's knowledge driving economies and the real wealth of a nation lies in its children, in its youth. And until and unless we realize that and start migrating very quickly to a knowledge-based uh, economy, uh, we are not going to move forward. Uh, I have created a 18 page document uh, on what exactly Pakistan needs to do in order to establish a knowledge economy. Those who are interested in this document, I'll be happy to pass it on to you so that you can see for yourself. And if you have then any suggestions of what else should have been included in this document, I'll be happy to incorporate your suggestions also. Thank you very much, and I'll be happy to try and answer any questions. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Uh, thank you very much, sir, for uh, your extensive presentation on this World Youth Skill Day. Uh, we all Pakistanis, we are really proud of you. And uh, I will just share a brief experience of myself, and then we will open the floor for question. Sir, I served in Malaysia for two years and everybody asked me, I was in University of Malaysia, Pahang, and they always asked me, have you seen, have you gone to Orens? I say, what do you mean by that one? <laughs> and that is Ataur Rahman Institute on Natural Product Discovery. Sir, you really made all Pakistani proud that in country like Malaysia, 
uh, we are we are recognized with uh, your kind contribution. Of course, like I mean, uh, we look forward to many many recognition beside all these civil award, international award, and uh, may Allah bless you, great health, and you keep contributing. We open the floor uh, now for questions. Here, anybody has a question? Yes, yeah, assalamualaikum. Uh, this is Farid Ansari. My uh, question is, Doctor Sab. Yes, yes. Uh, gee, fascinating uh, presentation, and I uh, just like I'm wide awake. It's 2 a.m. almost here, <laughs> but that is uh, amazing. So my question is, uh, Dr. Sab, uh, do we still have uh, the the issue of brain uh, brain drain in Pakistan, especially for skills with the you know higher uh, higher skills and uh, uh, people who have uh, completed you know um, long periods of uh, education, they're highly qualified, and then they leave. Is the, do we still have that issue? Uh, yes, uh, unfortunately, that is still there because, uh, uh, you see, the government has only that much capacity to absorb people. And uh, the HEC programs uh, that we, were, we were, uh, had a lot of emphasis on absorbing manpower within uh, the universities, uh, that uh, has not been sustained. and. Uh, HEC does not provide money now uh, for people to get absorbed within the universities itself. And unless you have industrial expansion and you have other opportunities besides the government sector, uh, industry unfortunately has not been expanding in Pakistan. Industrial development has been going down. Uh, we saw a, a, a huge boost of industrial expansion in the Musharraf era uh, when you had up to 19% in one year expansion of our industrial output. But now we have, unfortunately, we have not been expanding. So opportunities in the private sector are very limited. And so in fact, there is a serious problem of the students who are qualifying and have doctorate degrees. Their jobs are very difficult to get abroad also. They would like to go abroad, but the jobs are very difficult to get there. And jobs are very difficult to get within Pakistan as uh, also because of lack of opportunities, both within the universities, because of lack of funding, and within the uh, industrial sector, because of lack of industrial expansion. So this is uh, a real problem. Uh, so brain brain has uh, slackened, I would say, uh, not because the students do not want to go abroad, but because the chances of get them getting a, a job abroad are not so many. It's difficult for them to find jobs. Okay, thank you so much. Okay. Dr. Uh, can I ask a question? Yeah, sure. Please, sir. Uh, Dr. Sir, thank you very much for your emphasis on innovation. Uh, my question is that because I am a social scientist, so I would like to emphasize that you emphasize this and tell me how much emphasis on this thing that the social sciences and natural sciences are going interdisciplinary research. Karni hai. जैसे कि आपने आप, आपकी अपनी रिसर्च न्यूरोसाइंस पे बहुत है आ, मैंने जब यहां पाकिस्तान आया तो मैंने देखा कि हमारे बहुत से बुजुर्ग जो है वो डिमेंशिया का शिकार हैं और डिमेंशिया जो है वो नेचुरली वी नीड बेटर नॉलेज ऑन न्यूरोसाइंस लेकिन जो उसका मेजर चैलेंज था वो ये था कि हमारी सोसाइटल अवेयरनेस नहीं है तो जहां हम बहुत सी रिसर्च नेचुरल साइंस की इनोवेशन में कर रहे हैं वहीं हमने बहुत सा एम्फसिस प्लेस करना है अपनी सोशल साइंस पर भी तो मैं चाहूँगा कि आप इसको इंटरडिसिप्लिनरी नेचर ऑफ रिसर्च को भी एम्फसाइज करें और अपना व्यू दें और ख़ुशुसन ये बात कि इनोवेशंस में किस तरह फायदा हो सकता है कि इंटरडिसिप्लिनरी रिसर्च हो जी बिल्कुल आपने सही फरमाया � or social sciences is critical that we strengthen our educational system and strengthen the social sciences. In fact, uh, Dr. Suhail would remember that we had a program for 4 years, a bachelor's program in Pakistan. It was a big reason that we had a program recognized in the Bain al-Afami. The other reason was that we wanted to have social uh, humanities and social sciences strengthen within the educational system so science they are exposed to social sciences and they have a much better uh, 
world view of things and a more balanced view of uh, of things uh, so they should be blessed with the milk of human kindness as as shakespeare would say okay uh, you need to have a balanced system so it's extremely important to have uh, social sciences also strengthened in fact us zamane mein humne taqriban one third of the scholarships jo thi we set aside for social sciences but uh, only about 8 or 10% of the students could win the scholarships uh, for phd abroad because they were very weak and we, the last thing we wanted was to send very weak students abroad like in over a period of time things have changed and things have been becoming are becoming better but science and engineering has come up much faster than social sciences which is still lagging behind and we need need to invest uh, far more in social sciences but so here might want to add to that also uh, <laughs> nakvi sir uh, dr sir we have a uh, dr nakvi sir bhi abhi mere khayal mein he will add but we have a four or five people in line so okay. we are just uh, sure. prioritizing the question based on their first come first serve base so sure. with due apologies to everybody so first yeah. question i mean i i can just say over here is uh, from uh, सैयद पारे सली साहब नेक्स्ट इज प्रोफेसर डॉक्टर सुहेल नकवी साहब एंड देन वी हैव मोहम्मद तैयब साहब एंड प्रोफेसर डॉक्टर तैयबा जरीफ आई थिंक माय डीपेस्ट अपॉलोजीज टू अदर बिकॉज देयर आर एवरीबॉडी इज हैव अ क्वेश्चन आई थिंक वी विल जस्ट मेक अ कट ऑफ ओवर हियर सो फर्स्ट जी पारे साहब अस्सलाम वालेकुम डॉक्टर साहब थैंक यू सो मच to enlighten us with your views uh, and i i uh, we really need brains like you uh my question is about having science popularization do especially dr atau rahman sir aapne bahut zyada zor diya uh, science popularization par and you wrote in urdu language english and you wrote on every topic of science uh, to inculcate science in our minds लेकिन इसके बावजूद मैं देख रहा हूं कि हमारे यहाँ बाकी लोगों का इस पे तवज्जो बहुत कम है सर व्हाट सलूशन डू यू सजेस्ट कि जिसको हम एक कोई ऐसा पाथ हो जिसको हम फॉलो करें और साइंस पॉपुलराइजेशन को राइज कर सके पूरे मुल्क में जी दिस इज एक्सट्रीमली इम्पोर्टेंट कि साइंस को हम पॉपुलराइज करने की कोशिश करें आई है Uh, whatever i could i have written about 400 articles in dawn uh, in the past on uh, from an uh, layman's perspective of science i have written more than uh, around 270 or 80 articles in the news another 2 300 articles in jung and i have uh, written a book uh, on on uh, science uh, written in a way that everybody will enjoy which has been uh, which is both in english in urdu and it has also been translated into chinese what we should do is that i am uh, trying my best you see zamane mein aapko yaad hoga azim ke advice sahab hote the marhum wo science ke upar article likhte the bade dilchasp article hote the to hame bhi chahiye ki hum apna kalam uthaye aur is andaaz se likhna shuru kare aur koshish kare ki wo akhbaron mein publish ho ke jisse logon ki dilchaspi paida ho साइंस की तरफ माइल हो और देखेंगे कितना मजा आता है साइंस के अंदर तहकीक में और कितना अजीब व गरीब दुनिया है साइंस की तो इसके लिए हम सबको अपना अपना किरदार अदा करना पड़ेगा और टेलीविजन में भी इस पे प्रोग्राम्स आने चाहिए तो इट हैज़ बी अ जॉइंट एफर्ट बट आई स्टिल कंटिन्यू टू वर्क ऑन दिस पिछले लास्ट वेडनेस डे का अगर आप द न्यूज़ उठा के देखें so is the knowledge economy or some of the fascinating developments in science you will find my article there so i'm still writing as much as i can so every moment that i get i try to do whatever it like and but we must all do our our bit there professor nakvi sir i didn't understand thank that. you uh, the uh, history of uh, pakistani institution building um, is that of creation and destruction and the history of uh, research in the country and its support is basically aligned with the relationship of professor atau rahman with the ruler i am not mincing my words here may god bless you with a long life but how 
do we as a country develop an institutional framework for supporting uh, these things that lie at the very foundation of how nations are, are built? How do we go beyond that? Right. You see, the problem is that the system of governance that we have, uh, it's politicians that normally with little understanding of science, of its importance or of its dimensions and how it relates to socioeconomic development who become actually federal ministers of science. And the same applies to education. Uh, the secretaries who come in are also generalists and they also uh, do a run of the mill job and uh, keep on the ministries running, but they're not passionate and motivated to transform the country on the basis of uh, knowledge, on the basis of science. You need passion, you need determination and uh, a continuous effort. So I have been discussing this question that you have raised, Sohail, and uh, you might know General Khalid Kidboy, who was at time, one time heading SPD. He advised me that, look, uh, Imran seems to like you, the present prime minister, you should set up a knowledge economy authority, which should be linked to the planning ministry and uh, should work directly under the prime minister and should be the overriding uh, institution to drive this whole momentum of education, science, technology, innovation forward, irrespective of the government that comes into power, because the president system of government will always be so you need a, a, a completely different uh, uh, and a powerful driving force. So I have discussed this with the prime minister. The legal documents have now been completed and uh, the establishment is very keen that such an author authority should be formed. In fact, they will be moving this uh, to the government. And so we are looking for a system, just like a higher education commission money team, which is uh, working directly under the prime minister, but the knowledge economy will go beyond that. It, it, it's not about education. It's about socioeconomic development, uh, industrialization in high tech areas, ease of doing business, uh, the whole uh, ecosystem that's needed for us, the taxation structure, which at, at the moment is topsy-turvy, our end products pay up, cheese uh, uh, so taxes come here doing the basic the manufacturing taxes zada and the whole thing is boxy you know it's it's lopsided so the whole thing has to be changed with a vision and strategy so that is why i have i i worked and created this 18 page document which i was just mentioning the knowledge economy and i would appreciate critical inputs i'll email that document to you also uh dimensions missing here uh, innovation or creativity ke, uh, promote karne ke liye. and it, it cannot be just the higher education it has to start right at the bottom that's we are often missing the bunyadi jo kis se aap school level education dete hai. others will talk about it i deliberately didn't have time Lekin jo school level education hai, kis innovation culture paida hota hai, kis aage jate hai. so I, they, all that has to be transformed college education is a big black hole nobody is bothered about college education now without that you can't move forward so school education, college education, and the whole culture of uh, thinking uh, beyond the box uh, is extremely important. And the cultural change Again, I'm working on this knowledge economy authority, which may partly address the issue that you have raised, but there may be other things that we should do. And again, some critical inputs from you would be welcome. Uh, Muhammad Tayyip. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, Dr. Tauri Man, I have a question for you. I am a student of BS Biotechnology ka, last semester. Mera. To, sir, I have a lot of students who have been in the last semester. I have a lot of students who have been in the last semester. I have a lot of students who have been in the last semester. I have a lot of students who have been in the last semester. I have a lot of students who have been in the last semester. I have a lot of क्या इनिशिएटिव लेना चाहिए हमें थोड़ा सा आप थोड़ा पाथ डिफाइन कर दें हमारे लिए क्योंकि हमारे लिए बड़ा मुश्किल होता है कि हमें किस चीज को सेलेक्ट करना चाहिए किस तरह हमें इसको लेके चलना चाहिए तो कायल्डी स्टूडेंट्स के लिए थोड़ा सा आप करते हैं राइट आई थिंक इसी बायोटेक्नोलॉजी में दो बड़े एरियाज 
अच्छा मैं ये चाहूंगा कि एग्रीकल्चरल बायोटेक्नोलॉजी में बहुत जबरदस्त अपॉर्चुनिटीज पैदा हो रही हैं और आ सकती हैं इन टर्म्स ऑफ इम्प्रूविंग क्रॉप हील्स आइडेंटिफाइंग विच जीन्स आर रिस्पॉन्सिबल फॉर द टेस्ट विच जीन्स आर रिस्पॉन्सिबल फॉर द कलर द फ्रेग्रेंस फॉर डिजीज रेजिस्टेंस फॉर ड्राउट रेजिस्टेंस स्ट्रेस टॉलरेंस एटसेट्रा कैन वी क्रिएट प्लांट्स विच कैन बी ग्रोन ऑन इन सी वॉटर Uh, there are many uh, sea weeds which grow happily because nature has endowed them with genes which allow them. So why can't you grow fruit trees, vegetables, uh, rice, and other things using uh, saline water or sea water? I'm just giving you one example which comes across. Uh, it's a huge challenge. Two third of our planet is water. Unfortunately, it is salt water. But plants can grow in soft salt water, and genetics is now allowing us to understand. why certain plants do grow in salt water why can't we grow some of these plants through some uh, genetic modification unke andar jo pumping systems hote hain jo soil ko nikal dete hain jo stress tolerant system i am just giving the whole range of other areas so ek maine misal di agricultural biotechnology aur agricultural biotechnology ke andar is tarah ke uh, areas ke andar agar aap jaye to you know there the are fascinating areas to work upon humne bhi shuru kiya hai isi ke upar अपने इदारे में जो जमीर रहमान सेंटर फॉर जीनोमिक्स रिसर्च उसमें जो एग्रीकल्चरल बायोटेक्नोलॉजी का जो हमारा जो काम हो रहा है पार्ट ऑफ इट इज रिलेटेड टू सच सच इनिशिएटिव्स दैट जो मैंने अभी मेंशन किए हैं आपको सर लास्ट बट नॉट नॉट प्लीज प्रोफेसर डॉक्टर तय्यबा जरीफ साहब जी मिस तय्यबा हेलो जी जी कैन यू हेयर मी जी असला जी अस्सलाम वालेकुम डॉक्टर साहब ऑल ऑफ यू थैंक यू वेरी मच फॉर गिविंग मी दिस अपॉर्चुनिटी एंड कांग्रेचुलेशन ऑन ऑर्गेनाइजिंग दिस सच अ सक्सेसफुल इवेंट एंड डॉक्टर अताउर रहमान इज जस्ट लाइक अ मेंटर एंड रोल मॉडल फॉर ऑल ऑफ अस माय 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 कंसर्न और माय क्वेश्चन फॉर डॉक्टर साहब इज दैट नॉलेज एंड स्किल बोथ आर इंटीग्रेटेड एंड बोथ आर वेरी नेसेसरी एंड नाउ वी आर ऑन ऑन ऑनलाइन टीचिंग सिस्टम so how you are looking development of uh, skill development especially the professional skill development in uh, these kind of uh, circumstances and what is your input on the psychological impact of uh, covid 19 or uh, neuro learning and the skill development of the of the student especially at higher education level thank you very much hello हेलो डॉक्टर साहब हेलो हेलो आई लॉस्ट यू बिकॉज़ देयर वाज सम इंटरनेट प्रॉब्लम कैन यू रिपीट द क्वेश्चन हां जी हां जी डॉक्टर साहब थैंक यू वेरी मच आई वाज आस्किंग दैट नॉलेज एंड स्किल बोथ आर नेसेसरी एंड इंटीग्रेटेड बट नाउ वी आर ऑन ऑनलाइन एजुकेशन सिस्टम और ऑनलाइन टीचिंग so how you are looking uh, uh, the skill development especially the uh, professional skill development of the uh, students and uh, your input on the psychological impact of this uh, covid 19 or on neuro learning and skill development especially at the higher education level thank you very much dr saab yes. thank you very much so nice yes. of you thank you very much i think this is a wonderful opportunity uh, i i see the opportunity in this uh, uh, कि हम पहली दफा हमारे पास लोगों को अब बच्चों को आदत पड़ रही है कि इंटरनेट पे जाएं दे कैन गो एंड लुक एट दी वंडरफुल कोर्सेज दैट आर अवेलेबल एट ऑल लेवल्स स्कूल लेवल खान एकेडमी कोर्सेज कॉलेज लेवल यूनिवर्सिटी लेवल यू हैव अ ह्यूज ट्रेजर्स लाइंग आउट देयर सो वी हैव टू मूव टुवर्ड्स अ ब्लेंडेड सिस्टम ऑफ एजुकेशन वेदर इट्स स्कूल एजुकेशन और वेदर इट्स टेक्निकल एजुकेशन और वेदर इट्स हायर एजुकेशन so uh, working with uh, dr nadeem malik jo ke uh, hamare virtual university ke rector the aur ab wo canada chale gaye hain to hum maine ek project taiyar ki thi and i'm delighted to say that just been approved 3 uh, weeks ago on blended education 6 billion rupee project taaki hum jo bahut sare jo excellent courses hain wo hum istemal kare aur college mein aur university mein ye college ye courses uh, blend karke shamil kare और इसी तरह स्कूल लेवल कोर्सेज जो हैं वो हम शामिल करें खान एकेडमी के जो मैंने अभी आप शुरू होने से पहले मैं वेबसाइट का एड्रेस दे रहा था एल ई जे नंबर फोर चार लर्निंग डॉट कॉम डॉट पी के 
you'll find uh, tens of thousands of courses freely available, no registration, no payment. So, it's my school level courses be here. So, now the need is that we use these courses to use our universities, our colleges, our schools, because this is a wonderful opportunity for Pakistan to upgrade its educational system uh, with very little cost. All you need is access to these courses. And so I'm encouraging flipped learning uh, across the country in our universities. Many institutions have introduced this. Uh, what is flipped learning? You study from the best uh, lectures abroad, and then the class, much of the classroom time is used for discussion. MIT professor 38 minutes, 29 seconds, I did not understand it, sir. Can you explain? And the teacher then explains, looks, plays it back and explains it. So this kind of an environment will suddenly bring to us the best around uh, in the world at hardly any cost. So this is something, and these uh, 3,000 lectures Khan Academy ke Urdu may be available, hai, jase kaha. So this is what we have to do in a blended system. Ki taraf jana aur zyada se zyada mustafid hona chahiye kuch cheezon mein to aap nahi ja sakte practical so phir bhi aap padhne padenge lekin aap bade paimane ke upar ek blended system of education ki taraf hame tezi se padhna chahiye dr saab thank you very much uh, for your kind time and uh, entertaining all the question elaborately so uh, uh, honorable colleagues students so our next lecture a of the World Youth Skill Day is uh, on educational pathways to success. And you know, who tell us the educational pathways to success. Uh, Dr. Tufel Saab, we will have a question that we will entertain if we don't have a mind, we will ask you. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Dr. Go Tufel ahead. from Ghazi University. Yes, it is. You want to ask a question? Go ahead. Go ahead. Yes. My question is Dr. Taur Rahman Saab. Se. तो बहुत शुक्रिया पहले तो मैं अप्रिशिएट करता हूं डॉक्टर साहब आपने ये मैनेज किया इस वेबिनार को आई रियली अप्रिशिएट दिस ग्रेट अपॉर्चुनिटी और मेरा डॉक्टर साहब को मेरे लिए बड़ी ऑनर की बात है डॉक्टर तारू रहमान साहब को आज मैं डायरेक्टली बात कर रहा हूं मैं 2004 में व्हाइल व्हेन डॉक्टर साहब ही वाज चेयरमैन ऑफ एचईसी आई केप्ट इन कांटेक्ट विद हिम तो डॉक्टर साहब मेरा काम जो है बायो टेक्नोलॉजी पे है आई वर्क ऑलमोस्ट 20 22 इयर्स in Japan and then King Saudi University of Saudi Arabia. And uh, <clears throat> uh, Dr. Mukhtar Saab, he motivated me to apply for this position. Now I'm Vice Chancellor of Ghazi University, DG Khan. Uh, my whole work is on biotechnology and then RNAi. He said that, okay, you should apply for this position. I said, okay, well, this is political position, but I don't know if I could get the chance. But anyway, Alhamdulillah, I got the chance. Uh, my viewpoint is that, uh, of course, uh, without innovation and uh, research, there is no possibility for the socio-economic development of the country or any country. I wrote one, one uh, a article, success story of Japanese higher education, a potential paragon for Pakistan. So here DG Khan, I a center of excellence. I got approved center of excellence in molecular biology, biotechnology in DG Khan. मेरी विजन ये है या मैं ये सोच रहा हूँ कि पाकिस्तान के अंदर मुख्तलिफ यूनिवर्सिटीज के अंदर सेंटर ऑफ एक्सीलेंस इन बायोटेक्नोलॉजी क्रिएट किए जाएं और चैलेंजिंग रिसर्च फॉर द रिलेटेड टू एग्रीकल्चर और हेल्थ चैलेंजिंग प्रोजेक्ट्स दिए जाएं और उनको लीड किया जाए क्या कुछ इस तरह की इस वक्त और फिर एकेडमिया और इंडस्ट्री लिंकेजेस ट्रिपल हेलिक्स को क्रिएट किया जाए that is still lacking in Pakistan, in our country. So, kya is tarah ki quali, aisi policy is fakt hai, jo aap lead kar rahe ho, sir, is fakt? Ji, uh, knowledge economy task force ke tehet, jo projects hum fund kar rahe hain, uh, unke andar aise projects, jo ke commercial significance ke hain, either in the short term or in the longer term. And uh, uh, we have been funding such projects under the knowledge economy. Jaisi mainne kaha ke 120 Arab rupay ke projects is for under approval hain ya kuch fund kiye ja chuke hain. So if you have an idea, uska concept paper aap mujhe pijwa di jega. But in, the, in order to set up the a center that you're talking about, find one or two really good people and build around them. That is the key. Ke aap jo hai, eh, jab tak ke asal cheez hoti hai, uh, ke human resources. So uh, building it bach jati hain. So just find a few good people and then build around them and then it'll start happening. Like, and you have to be 
we have to be eternally optimistic as sohel would know he's sitting here hame mushkilat bahut aati thi lekin hamesha hum muskurate the aur ladte the keep on fighting irrespective and uh, never give in that is the spirit and inshallah then fir allah taala musabbul asbab e darwaze kholta jata hai सर लेट लेट्स लेट्स कंटिन्यू ये जो आपने फरमाया मुस्कराना चाहिए और लड़ना चाहिए सो so, 